All right, hey guys, Kyle Lance Martin here. We are back with day two of Revive School. We're jumping in from Genesis 1, 2, and 3 as we covered yesterday. And what we're doing is, is that we're beginning to just go through all of the scriptures, specifically the book of Genesis, and saying, hey, where's Christ in this? Where is the Messiah? What is the complete picture uh, of the Messiah, even starting in Genesis? And so, all right, I, I'm joined here with my good buddies. We got Rich, Kevin, Jeff, and TJ, also known as Tom Jankowski. Do you guys remember the one word, that all of the Genesis that we're, we're after? What's the one word? Seed. Seed, good. Wow, that's, a, that's the most I've heard you guys talk all in unison. This is good. This is going to be a good day today. Seed. Okay, where in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 do we find the seed of Christ? 3.15. Genesis 3.15. That's good. Genesis 3.15, it just says, I will put, this is God talking, I will put hostility, enmity between you and the woman, the, the, sa- the snake and the woman, and I'm going to put between, uh, in between your seed and her seed, between Satan and, and the woman. And then he says, he will strike your head and, he, and you will strike his heel. You have right here the first messianic prophecy. Christ is the answer to the fall of man. Now watch, we've been over here before, but this is the painting from Mindy Oten in Canada. And that when the fall of man happened, it doesn't look good, but there's still the seed, the seed of Christ found in Genesis 3.15. You can also find that in Galatians 3.16 and 19. And so again, all of it's going to build. But now here you have Adam and Eve. They've sinned. Now what do they do? <laughs> like, well, we lost everything. You know, kind of, it's kind of true. So watch in Genesis 4, this is where we're going to go today. Now remember, your one word again, and this is my little handy board up here. Your one word for all of Genesis is seed. Okay, how does the seed of Christ integrate into all this? Well, in Genesis 4, 1, Adam and Eve, they didn't mess around. Well, they decided to get intimate. <laughs> and they said, let's have relations. And so here, why I say that is they had a kid. They conceived and gave birth to Cain. Why that's important is because what happens, I think, you guys, is that when sometimes you fall in sin and you give into temptation, I think some of us just get stuck. I think some of us think we can't move on. What I love about Adam and Eve is that they moved forward with life. They knew that there was hope because they were told that there was going to be hope. So she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, this is Eve, I've had a male child with the Lord's help. Now, man, there's so much here that we could get into. And I think it's really interesting. Is she giving God credit or is she saying it's all about me? I don't know. I think there's a little bit of something for you to discuss in your discussion groups. And I hope you guys that you really begin to dig into these discussion groups because once a week, you're going to gather together and say, how can we go deeper than what Kyle's even talked about? Because that's my goal. I want you to be eager to examine the scriptures. That's how school works. That's how seminaries work. You have to do the work. We just, we just set the stage for you guys. So if you would go to verse two. And so whenever I say verse two, just so you know, that means Kevin back there, he's pressing some buttons or he's typing in Genesis. So in Genesis 4, two, it says, then she also gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, go back to verse one, if you would, Kevin. Verse one, it just says, I've had a a male child with the Lord's help. So first of all, here you have, I'm going to go to the board. Her first child was Cain. And then in verse two, it says, the next thing you know, then she also gave birth to his, his brother, Abel. Okay, so this is really interesting. Now, Abel became a shepherd of flocks. So I'm just going to put uh, shepherd here. But Cain, he cultivated the land. So I'm just going to call him Kevin, you're, you're, a, you're a former farmer type person. Is it okay that we call Cain a farmer? Is that a proper? Yeah, it's farmer and rancher. Oh, so you would like rancher to be for Abel? Okay, so we're going to go with rancher. That's good, Kevin. I'm just, you guys, one thing you have to learn about it, when we do this kind of talk, it's because we like each other. Okay, so relax, okay? Genesis 4, 3, now this, is where, this is where it's going to get interesting. Hang on. Let me do something else with Cain. I feel like I need to do this just to kind of start painting a picture. With Cain, his word means, and this is really interesting, okay? His name actually means to acquire, okay? Or to possess. In the English language, if you were to take the Hebrew and take these Hebrew words, okay, and you would say, what does that really mean in English? It means God. It's kind of interesting when you start thinking about the seed and you start thinking about the, the, the issues that are going to go on. But then when you look at Abel, Abel's name, you guys know you guys know what it means? Anybody? Okay. Rich? Negative. It means vanity. Really, what I really like, though, is it means breath. You know what that really means? It means it's short-lived. Like, whew. And so here you have Cain, got it. Abel, 
breath. Just, and so I think that's important because what you're going to see is this. Now, I hope you follow me on this, you guys. The seed for Cain, okay, now watch. There's two different types of seeds. How do I know? Because watch this, okay? In verse 3, I'm in Genesis 4, 3. In the course of the time, Cain presented some of the land's produce. So Cain, as a farmer, he presented some, that's really interesting, you guys, some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. Okay, without going into any study further, what, what bothers you about that right there? Anybody? What do you guys say? He only gave some of it. Yeah, he only gave some of them. Compared to what? He had more to give. He had more to give. So if he had more to give, it means he actually he held, held back. back. He held back. So Cain held back the produce as an offering to the Lord. Now watch, watch this. <laughs> In verse 4 of Genesis 4, And Abel also presented an offering some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offerings. Okay, there's, there's some fun things here. So as a rancher, you like that, Kevin? You guys, on day 14, can you imagine? Kevin's going to be here probably. <laughs> I'm sorry, Kevin, can't keep up. I'll try. <laughs> All right, so, so Abel, he gave the firstborn, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. In Scripture, that means he did not hold back. God saw fit that Abel was the chosen one, not Cain. For the longest time, that really, really bothered me. How on earth can you just say, God, I choose Abel and not Cain? Like, that doesn't even seem fair. That doesn't seem right. But what God saw was the heart behind what they presented. God looked at the inner condition of the man's heart and said, oh, I, I really see the motives here. I see the motives and what, what had happened was, I think Cain, Cain was kind of like those guys in, in Isaiah 29, 13. So Kevin, if you can, I-S-A-I-I-A-I-I-I. Yeah. <laughs> Isaiah 29, 13. Now watch. This, this is what I see with Cain right here. The Lord said, because these people approach me with their mouths to honor me with lip service, yet their hearts are far from me and their worship consists of man-made rules learned by rote. What I see is Cain, I see Cain just faking it. What can I get by to present something to the Lord? And the Lord goes, oh, I'll call you out on that. You got nothing. I'm going to go with Abel. This is who I like. And I'm telling you guys, God sees everything. And so all of a sudden, what you see, and here, let's go to the seed. Remember the seed of Christ. You have the seed of, I believe, is the seed of the serpent over here with Cain. And then I think with Abel, you have the seed of the woman. Okay, I'm going to make it even more plain. Okay, the seed of the woman as seen as Abel he is representing his love for God. And what you see in Cain is that you're the seed of the serpent. You see that he is reproducing his spiritual enmity, the hostility towards God. Okay, I, that, is that too much, you guys? Do you think that's too heady? Do you think, you're, are we grasping that? We're good. We're good. Good stuff. I, I, I think, though, that what we see here is this is constantly the tension that you and I have to face in whatever county we're in. Do we want to be Abel or do we want to be Cain? Do we want to function as the seed of the woman who we know we have the seed of Christ or do we function like the, the, the serpent seed where we're always trying to go against God and get away with whatever we can? Cain's whole thing is, I got it. I'm going to get it for myself. Abel was just a breath of life. He was, well, we'll get to that in a second. I almost blew my cover. Just so you know, Cain kills Abel. Okay, so yeah. All right, so a couple other things. The firstborn is really important. I want to tie this in to, to Jesus, Okay. When you're talking about the firstborns, this is really important. Kevin, if you would, would you go to Exodus, uh, Exodus 34, 19? Exodus 34, 19 talks about making the firstborns, making the first things, everything that are important to the Lord. Moses is writing this. And just so you know, Moses writes the first five books of, of, uh, of the Pentateuch. The firstborn male from every womb belongs to me including all your male livestock, the firstborn of cattle or sheep. Now, I know this is down the road. You know, Abel might not have known it at the time, but he knew that he was supposed to offer the best. There's more about the firstborn than I think is really, it's mind-blowing. Deuteronomy 12, verse 6, if you'll go there, Kevin. Deuteronomy 12, verse 6, it continues to talk about bringing the best. You are to bring there your burnt offerings and sacrifices your tents and personal contributions, your vow offerings and free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. You are supposed to give the best to the Lord. Not what you can get away with. And you know, I, 
I don't know. Sometimes, Rich, you know what we should do, Rich? We should build a little pedestal, a soapbox. Because I'm getting ready to go on a soapbox. And I know when I'm getting ready to go on a soapbox. I'm getting on my soapbox right now. You think that thing would hold, Rich? Nope. Yeah. Yeah, right? You think it would good crumble under me. <laughs> Let's give it a try. Look, here's what I think's happened in the American church. We've done this for 10 years. We've traveled all over the United States. We've worked with some of the smallest churches, some of the largest churches. We've worked with uh, international churches and good old white American churches, whatever you want to like. I feel like we've seen it all. Pentecostals and charismatics, conservatives and people that don't believe in music, all of the stuff, all of those stuffs we've seen. And I believe the American church is holding back what God is saying, give to me. So I would need Revival. We have a spirit of Cain that is so obvious in the church. The reality is, is Jesus says, no, I, I don't want your seconds. I want your best. And Abel was willing to even give up everything he could to his father because he recognized it was an offering to the Lord. You can say, well, Kyle, how, how can you say that? I, I'll tell you what, when you've traveled enough and you say, hey, would you go out and share the gospel with me? And people are like, no. That's for somebody else. You're holding back. I don't, I don't get it, actually. Your life is not yours if you have the seed of Christ inside of you. It's not even an option. And yet for some reason, we think we can choose which day we want to function as a serpent, the seed of the serpent, or the of the seed of the woman. It's like we play this game, we can choose whichever one feels best. It's not an option anymore if we want to see a move of God. It all comes down to our motives. Walt Kaiser, uh, he says this, God always inspects the giver and the worshiper before he inspects the gift, the service, or the worship. You know what that means? He'll call your bluff. What I want to do with the Revive School is I want us to have a pure motive as we do everything. You know, my dad, who's a part of this school, uh, I love this, that I want my dad to have a pure motive as he pours into Ace Hardware customers, not so he can get their business, but because he loves them and he wants to invest into them. And I know my dad has that desire. You know, if some of you are, are in the Amish community, and you're like, I, I want a pure motive. Everything has to be done for the Lord. And when you do that, he'll honor that. That's when we're going to see a true move of God. Paul did it with 12 guys in Acts 19 in the city of Ephesus, in the community of Ephesus. Man, it, it just took off. So let's go to the firstborn component here. If you would, go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, Kevin. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. I love this. It says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. Look how Christ is identified by the Apostle Paul as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So what happens is that Abel is actually presenting a foreshadow of Christ as the first fruits. And so, yeah, we have this seed, but I love that imagery of, I feel like a seed in the first fruits. I feel like, does that mean, they go together. Like it's the seed of the first fruits. And keep going in verse 21, Kevin. It just, it just, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. Watch this. In 22, we're going to keep going. For as in Adam, all die. So also in Christ, all will be made alive. So when you function in the spirit of seed, you die. But when you function in the spirit of the seed of Christ, you live. And then it continues on in verse 23. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits afterwards at his coming, to those who belong to Christ, here we go, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he abolishes all rule and all authority and power. It keeps going to verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 25. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. It starts with the first fruits. And in verse 26, you're right there. The last enemy to be abolished is death. 27, it continues on. For God has put everything under his feet, but when it says everything is put under him, it's obvious that he who puts everything under him is the exception. I love this in 28 and 29. And when everything is subject to Christ, then the Son himself will also be subject to the one who subjected everything to him so that the God, so that God may be 
all in all, in all, excuse me, in verse 29, otherwise what will they do who are being baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, then why are people being baptized for them? I'm telling you guys, it starts with Christ as the seed, which then here you have the picture of Abel. Guess what? Christ, all of a sudden, he's the first fruit. He's the first fruit. And in Genesis 4, verse uh, 5, it says he didn't have regard for Cain and his offering. He didn't give him the best. Cain was furious and he looked despondent. I mean, what in the heck does despondent mean, Rich? <laughs> uh, he kind of lost his countenance. He lost it. He lost it so much that the Lord noticed, and it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you furious? Why do you look despondent? In verse 7, watch what Cain says. He says, you know, the Lord says, excuse me, if you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It's, it's, desi it's desires for you, but you must rule over it. You guys, here's what I love about how God works. Is that even though Cain messed up, he was actually given a second chance. I promise you, if you're watching today, you and I have struggled and messed up. But God is just saying, but if you do what is right, you will be accepted. You can come to me. And you know what Cain did? He did the opposite. Cain said to his brother, hey, let's go out to the field. You know what that's called? That's called premeditation. You have the first murder in Scripture. You have the first religious war that took place between Cain and and Abel. You have it between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. You have a first full-on battle, and it's planned. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. But God, if Kevin, if you'd go back, go back, Kevin, if you would, to verse 7. God gave him an out. He says, if you do what is right, won't you be accepted? In other words, if you, but if you do what is, if you not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. You have a choice. We all have a choice. All we have to do, you guys, is humble ourselves and say, I was wrong. Isaiah 66, 2. This is what the Lord's looking for. Isaiah 66, verse 2, uh, Scripture just says this, My hand made all these things. And so they all came into being. This is the Lord's declaration. I will look favorably on this kind of person. One is humble. One who is humble, submissive in spirit, and trembles at my word. Cain did the complete opposite. That's where we get that classic phrase, raising Cain. He got so mad, he went and killed his brother, the first murder in Scripture. Why? Because he functioned in the spirit of the seed of the serpent, not in the seed of Christ. But here's what I want to encourage all of us. Go to, Kevin, if you would, go to Proverbs 28, 13. Proverbs 28, 13 talks about, okay, let's just say I didn't bring to the table my best. God can redeem anything. And he says, the one who conceals his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find Mercy. Praise God for second chances. If you would go to James 4, verse 8. James talks about this as well, same concept. James 4, verse 8 says, Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, double-minded people. In other words, when you intentionally draw near to the Lord, Cain could have had a, a second chance. Then he missed it. You go to the New Testament, Acts 3.19. Acts 3.19 is kind of where we just kind of want to just kind of start landing this plane. In Acts 3.19, Scripture says, Therefore repent and turn back, so that your sins may be wiped out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And do you know how that happens? The first fruits. God through Jesus Christ is our first fruits. And how is he the first fruits? Because he was the seed that we know was the answer to overcome all of this. Okay, so our guys, camera crew, computer guys, sound guys, I don't know, when you hear this, what, what's something that you feel like needs to be shared so that our, our folks are just saying, hey, don't forget about this, or this part is standing out to me. Is there, is there anything that just specifically stands out to y'all? wasn't necessarily about what he gave, but it was his heart condition. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Anything else? Yeah, I, I was thinking um, it's kind of crazy because Cain was still giving something. You know, it really had to do with where his heart was, and he was thinking more about himself than what about he was supposed to be giving. So. 
It was a me mentality. Kevin, if you would go to Jude, it's interesting, Jude 1. Uh, you don't have to say the chapter 1 because there's only one chapter. So when you go to Jude 11, uh, which I actually named my, my youngest son, my only son, after the book of Jude. And at the time, Jude Law. You guys remember Jude Law? <laughs> Just saying, it's the only name I knew at the time. Uh, Kevin, go to verse 11, if you would, please. Uh, Jude, verse 11. Woe to them, for they've traveled in the way of Cain, having abandoned themselves to the heir of Balaam for profit and having perished in Korah's rebellion. And it continues on in verse 12. These are the ones who are like dangerous reefs at your love feasts. They feast with you, nurturing only themselves without fear. They're waterless clouds carried along by, by winds, trees in late autumn, fruitless. Do you see that? Fruitless. Cain was fruitless. Twice dead, pulled out by roots, and then in verse 13, wild waves of the sea foaming up their shameful deeds, wandering stars for whom who the blackness of the darkness is reserved forever. I'm telling you guys, we've got to start being careful of people in the church. I'm just going to tell you. There are a whole lot of Cain's that are, if you go back to verse 12, there are these clouds that, what does it say? They're waterless clouds carried along by winds. They're these trees in late autumn. They're fruitless. They're already dead. In fact, the only thing they want is exactly what Jeff just said. It's about them. I'm telling you guys, we can't function like that. If we want to change culture, we can't be about ourselves. We have to be about Him. Bring the best to the table. The whole book of Jude... It's about warning people it's not going to get easier. And we got to contend for the faith. And when you contend for the faith, it's because you recognize there are canes out there today. So bring the first fruits, which is Christ. Bring Christ everywhere you go. I got one more verse, and hopefully this will tie everything in again along with Jude. 1 John 3, verse 11. 1 John 3, verse 11. Uh, it's a cool picture again. For this is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another, unlike Cain. So when you have the seed of Christ, can I just tell you, you have love. Ooh, hey, hold please. You have love for God and love for others. But unlike Cain, who was, one, who was of the evil one, that's how I know he had the, ser the serpent seed. Scripture actually calls and says he was of the evil one and he murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Abel, the shepherd, the rancher, he was righteous. Cain, he was evil because he was of the evil one. And in verse 13 of 1 John 3, Scripture says, Don't be surprised, brother, if the world hates you. I think it's an interesting tie-in, but what I really believe is happening is that over and over with time, as the Lord comes, I believe He's coming, you guys, and I believe He's coming at any time. Don't be surprised that if you function in righteousness and bring the first fruits, the world's going to hate you. But when you bring the first fruits of Christ, when you bring Christ to the table, you got nothing to lose because your life is not yours anyway. Genesis 4 through 6, there's a whole lot here. And my prayer is, is that you got another picture of Christ. Abel brought the best. There's a foreshadow as a picture of Christ being the best. Don't bring the second. Don't bring uh, the leftovers because that's Satan. Interesting picture, Genesis 1 through 6. The seed and the first fruits all point to Christ. Thanks for reading uh, day two. And my prayer is this, that you'll continue to press in more than what you heard here. So Lord, I just pray right now that you bless this teaching, this interaction, this discussion, this dialogue, and that Lord, you would show us where we're at today. Encourage our hearts to be more like Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks.